Esther Eng is Chief Sustainability Officer at CDL. CDL means City Development Limited. Esther is an, advo in a, is, sorry, an active advocate for green building and sustainability for over two decades. She has been instrumental in establishing City Development Limited leadership in sustainability. It is ranked top real estate companies on the 2021 Global 100 Most Suitable Corporation in the World. It became the first real estate conglomerate in Southeast Asia to sign the World Green Building Council Net Zero Carbon Building in February 2021. Esther was conferred 2018 Singapore Pioneer for Green Infrastructures and a Low Carbon Economy by the United Nations Global Compact. She is also a signatory of the UNGC Caring for Climate Networks and an Executive Council member of the UN ESCP Sustainable Business Network. She has many, many positions in different council and boards. She is recognizing that youth engagement and female empowerment is crucial for climate action. She founded Women for Green Network in 2017 and the Youth for Climate Initiatives in 2018. More recently, City Development Limited partnered with Singapore Youth for Climate Action at the COP26 and launched the Keep Calm and Love Our Planet campaign, a series of programs engaging youth from around the world to support our vision. I quote, turning climate anxiety into positive action. The project aims to promote positive thinking and creative collaboration for climate solutions among youth, showing that everyone can play a positive role in this global race to net zero. Thank you very much to welcome with me Esther Ang. Hello, hi everyone, you can hear me clearly? Yeah, thank you for the very comprehensive, you know, <laughs> uh, introduction, uh, Xavier. So I was actually briefed by your professor that um, I should take, uh, you know, the imagination, you know, as the focus for this uh, lecture. So this is not a marketing uh, 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 lecture. So I want to ask you, can you raise your hand? Do you think that a carbon zero world is possible? Not immediately, maybe 10 years' time, or, you know, by 2030, 2050? Hands? I think it's less than half, yeah? But I know that most of you come from Europe or France, and you are actually taking the lead in, you know, your country has been taking the lead in climate action. And uh, for Asia, we are actually chasing. So everyone in this race to net zero, has a, has a part to play. And uh, ASEAN is actually the third largest population in the world. Okay? And then it is undergoing very rapid urbanization. And uh, how we design, build, and manage our infrastructure and building make a really huge difference. Currently, uh, cities account for almost 70% of greenhouse gas emission, and buildings alone, 40%. So even you are not in the building sector, you live in one, right? You stay in home, you know, you, 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 you study and you use buildings, whether you travel, whether, you know, you, you dine out and all that. So, as users, you can also make a difference. Okay, I know this is early and some of you have probably jet lag. This picture is just a warm-up or wake-up call. <laughs> what do you see in this image, anyone? Anyone want to give it a try? This is not a... Uh, computer-generated image. It was taken about uh, two weeks ago when I was walking at uh, the Lower Pierce Reservoir. I was looking at the cloud. It was an evening, sunset, and then I was looking at this cloud. It was actually from changes from a white cloud into something like, like a flying phoenix bird. I was asking a, a few friends and all that. I was so excited after I took it and I brought home and they asked, you know, the family members and you were saying, oh, look like a bird, look like, you know, a phoenix and all. It does look like, you know, that is how imagination works. When you even look at anywhere around the world, you know, the sky, the trees, the, the sea, you can imagine things. And uh, that actually can inspire ideas, okay? And that actually makes me very excited, you know close to nature, looking at sunset, and suddenly this cloud form like a phoenix, you know. Then I was like, oh, wow, it's so exciting, right? So it just changed the mood also. 
That's why how you, you know, react to the environment is very important. And how we change and build uh, you know, the surrounding is also very important. Okay, this is something that I think all of you know that we are really, the world is in a climate emergency. And uh, every now and then you will hear, you will see news and all that about you know, uh, climate crisis, uh, ESG risk. ESG is environmental, social and governance. And uh, there's a lot of acronyms, so pardon me if you don't you know, uh, uh, immediately know it, please raise your hand, I will, I will just explain. So ESG risks are really around us, whether it is environmental, extreme weather, flood, you know, and, and, and all, rising sea level, and uh, also, you know, um, social, societal uh, risks are very important. I mean, the world has been, you know, uh, under this uh, global pandemic for 20 months or more already, and we still have no sight of ending. In fact, quite a number of friends and contacts actually call up and they have actually contacted you know, uh, uh, Omicron over the last couple of weeks. So it is really spreading very fast. And uh, so how does it have an impact on the society, on the economies are very important. As businesses, you know, like hospitality industry, building industry, every industry is affected because we can't even trans you know, ship in building materials. At the, at the peak of you know, pandemic, and uh, we're still struggling with workers because in Singapore, we rely a lot on migrant workers. And if they can't come in, the work has to stop. So there are a lot of uh, polit uh, social and also economic impact you know, under all these ESG risks. And uh, I was very um, privileged that uh, attending the COP26 at Glasgow was a very rich uh, experience. And two years ago, I was also at the COP25 at um, Madrid. And I would say that the two are really very different, the two COP. COP26, whether you judge whether it is a, a success or you know, a near success or failure, that is very subjective. But one thing for sure that it actually keeps the conversation alive. Climate action is really you know, um, at the peak of attention. Uh, there were so many media from different parts of the world and uh, as compared to COP25, when I came back, nobody really talked about it. You know, you don't see it in the media. But COP26, prior to the, you know, the trip, our own newspaper, leading newspaper, you know, is already covering it and talking about our youth campaign. Just now, uh, 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 Prof. Xavier was talking about the Keep Calm campaign because research shows that there's huge climate anxiety problem on the rise not just affecting the businesses, but youth are the biggest you know, age group from uh, 17 to 25, if I'm not mistaken, that the research uh, of 10,000 youth and, uh, across 10 nations shows that 60% or more uh, youth being surveyed say that they feel hopeless, they feel disappointed, they feel very sad about the future. So climate anxiety is real. That's why we launched this campaign and now uh, we're going to share the link to invite you to join our webinar on the uh, webinar on the 21st of January, and uh, we have a panel that uh, with international, you know, youth champion and activists to share what are their worries, what are their wishes, you know, uh, whether it is in Asia, Africa, you know, and China. We want people to talk about it and uh, to also share. Don't bottle up your worry and anxiety. Turn this worry and anxiety into action. We can all do something, right? Big or small, you can, you can do something. Yeah, so these are the, you know, race to zero is everywhere when you are at COP. You, you turn here, you see zero, turn everywhere, it's like race to zero. So you can really feel the urgency. And of course, there are also actions, you know, by the uh, national level, UN level, and the business level. And uh, what I see, uh, saw the difference is this year, we have a lot of youth movement on the ground because I think Italy was also a co-organizer the focus was engaging youth. So we really see a lot of youth movement, uh, protests also you know, outside the, the campus. So it was very exciting. And what is more uh, influential, you know, the impact is actually um, all these net zero alliances were formed. And you know the value chain, right? Businesses cannot grow without the support of financial investors. And if you are asset owner, uh, infrastructure owner, you need insurance support. You just look at these three, that they are the ones who actually really decide and have an impact on your bottom line. And uh, Asset Owner Alliance are the investors. That was formed even the last COP already, 2019. 
and uh, you can hear a lot more investors' voices to call for ESG focus by corporate, uh, especially listed company. And then Net Zero Insurance Alliance has been formed in July last year because in the end of the day, any damage to infrastructures and building, who paid it up, right? Normally, it's the insurers. So the, even the uh, first half of last year, the insurer losses on infrastructure due to climate threats hit a new high, 40 over billion. Okay? So this is going to, to continue to grow. And then banks, no one can do business without financial support, without bank support. So they're also screening out you know, so-called dirty industry, and they will focus on uh, use, using ESG to screen their uh, financing uh, support. So Race to Zero is growing really, really fast. Uh, from last year to the, uh, uh, 2019 to 2020, end of 2020, when we were at COP, uh, this was what's reported. Uh, participating cities, organizations, businesses, investors, all represent about 90% of the whole world's GDP. 90%, which is really a lot. And you can really feel the impact and the momentum. And of course, you can make a commitment, but action is more important. And how do you track the, you know, the impact and report it and disclose it in a transparent manner is also very important. So all these are the voices of leaders and all. You know, I'm sure you all know Greta very well. And there are actually many Gretas alike in different parts of the world. And we have met some and we are going to share and showcase some of them on the 21st the webinar that they, we have like from Canada, from US, um, from um, South America, uh, even uh, China, Japan, and the uh, and ASEAN region. Um, of course, you have UN Nida have been calling for action for the longest time. And uh, Larry Fink, you know money talks, right, when you talk about business. You, you guys are business school students, right? Investor, Larry Fink is actually the, you know, has been a leader uh, to drive climate uh, ESG investment for more than four years ago already. Every year, I think his letter is coming out soon already. Every year, he issued a letter to CEO and uh, setting the direction for net zero commitment. In the past, it used to be climate action. And uh, a couple of years ago, he already said net zero. You don't just talk about, I'm committed to climate you know, action, full stop. They will screen you out. So he expects company to pledge for net zero and also showcase a strategy. And this is what, you know, uh, investor can really drive change. And of course, BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world. So what they say, what he say is very important to set the direction. And of course, we have a, a, a lot more NGO from even different parts of the world and uh, talking about it. And one thing is very, very important, media. Media is big influence, right? Whether social media or, 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 or conventional media. And uh, what we feel the difference is this year, COP was really widely covered. And even before we came back, there was already a lot of event lined up that, hey, please come and, uh, you know, even this week, we still have panel to talk about, hey, come back and talk, talk, to, you, talk to us about what is the impact of the climate pact form at Glasgow. So these are the, you know, some of the examples. These are the leading ones that you know, I have actually uh, shared at the Wall Street Journal, uh, Reuters uh, event, and uh, Financial Times, The Edge. And two more coming up is actually The Economist is coming up, and the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, all uh, holding sustainability uh, conferences and conversation. So this is uh, actually, it was covered before our trip. And uh, this is so-called the Singapore de delegation. We are very small. And Singapore is a small country. And uh, we also don't have really a big delegation. But we were very happy that we actually attracted some attention there. When uh, um, I was with uh, these two young leaders, is from Singapore Youth for Climate Action. So we were all there. And then it attracted a lot of attention. We have quite a few panels and, and uh, sharing our campaign. I mean, you know, London, you know, the keep calm thing is very, very in, right? So we just use this as like uh, uh, to, to draw attention. And uh, next week, we are going to uh, showcase a video that we captured at uh, COP, uh, sharing the voices of about 30 of our climate leaders that we captured during COP. So uh, look out to uh, look out, uh, lock on and uh, join us for the conversation. 
And uh, this is the investment community. Their voices is really very important. And uh, I talked about uh, BlackRock already. And there are actually a lot of business case. We don't just talk about risk mitigation nowadays. We talk about risk adaptation. And we also want to turn it into business case because in order to sustain your effort, businesses have to know that, hey, what exactly is the ROI? Would it bring benefits to my company and my stakeholders, consumer products and all? So that is why that, you know, investors' voices are very important. And as a listed company, we need to be on the good book of investors. So PRI has been talking about it and pushing the agenda, and you see the growth. The AUM, they are actually uh, have like about 4,000 over signatory. And for CDL, we are also a member under the investment uh, category. So we are adhered to the principle for responsible investment. And we have, you know, guideline and all, how we decide, make decision on acquisition and, or, or, you know, uh, investment. So, Exciting time, and uh, of course you know about, you heard about sustainable finance, right? Yeah, whether it is green bond or, you know, social bond, and also sustainability linked loan here is very, very popular now. And uh, you can see the growth here. The biggest sectors that make use of green financing is actually building sector and also energy. Energy and building go hand in hand. You can't, you know, even uh, enjoy the environment, right, if we are in the tropics. So cooling is very important. But where, you know, uh, the temperate country, they focus not just about cooling, it's actually warming, heating is very important for winters and all. So energy consumption is the key OPEX, you know, operating expenses of buildings. So that's why um, you can see that we can tap onto sustainable finance to accelerate action, to improve green building, for retrofitting, for new development and all. Okay. Innovation, that is also linked to the topic of imagination, okay? Never say never. I've been, I, I've been in the industry for 20 over years, and uh, in the past, 10 over years ago, when we say LED light and all that, it's like, oh, it's expensive, and then people will still query, right? Today, LED light is nothing, right? It's almost a norm already. Everybody will say, yeah, okay, LED light, you know, so what, you know? And then, like, sustainability reporting. If you say 10 years ago, you publish, you know, a report you can make news but today it's expected you know you, you have to have a website you have to have a report otherwise you are you lose your license to operate already so innovation never change never stop change is not really a choice so uh, research also show that companies that make use of downtime or during crisis to innovate will do better you can see the chart here from 2007 to 2013 those companies that invest in uh, innovation during crisis. Actually, this is the time, you know, the 2020, 2021, when we, companies are hit by COVID, the actions are really down, you know, really loud period. In fact, for us, for my team, sustainability team, we are very happy that we, we double our, our headcount over the last 2020 to 2021. Apart from the sustainability strategic team and communication team, we added a sustainable innovation green building team just to focus on scouting for technology innovation and most importantly is the application. No point to just dream of something that, oh yeah, yeah, very nice, but how do you apply it and really create impact and uh, reduce you know, uh, energy consumption and raise energy efficiency and uh, tapping on renewable energy and all. So this is actually for, um, since 2014, we actually conduct an annual uh, materiality study among our key stakeholders. And you can see that innovation is, you know, from 2017 to 2019 is the number one ESG issue, most important, most material to our business. And uh, 2020 is a bit different because of COVID, the health and safety become the number one, but innovation maintained as number two. So it shows that stakeholder, Consumers all believe that we should, companies should take long-term view, should innovate and should drive change. But you can see this number uh, 21. This is, unfortunately, a lot of companies feel that they are not equipped for change. They are not equipped for innovation. And uh, I think the challenge is some management may not believe in it, not exercising enough imagination or not open to idea for change. So, 
more about 80% of the you know, uh, research uh, survey company feel that they are not equipped to drive change and innovate. And this re re uh, report is by McKinsey. So when we talk about innovation for us, we look at green building. Okay? When we first started green building, like almost two decades ago, a lot of people feel that it's like, oh, okay, it's good to have, you know, it's, it's okay, you know, you, you, don't, you don't need it, you know, but it's really, you know, if you have it, it's good. If you don't have it, it's fine too, because customers are not looking, not asking for it, and uh, investors are not asking for it. But now, today is very different. Green building is almost a norm already. It's always it's, it's like a license for you to build because regulators are, are you know, imposing very strict regulation on this. If you don't adhere to green mark in Singapore, you can't develop, you can't retrofit. Okay, so it is a license to operate, and uh, this is actually World Green Building Council's, you know, the, the chart we are looking at. How do we build green, build sustainable building, and how does it really link to, you know, to tackle climate change, to be resilient, and uh, to be resilient for the people and for economies also. So turning something that is, is about mitigation to adaptation, to create value for, you know, the environment, for people and business as well. And uh, green plan, Singapore green plan. Some of you probably you know are familiar with this. Some of you may be new to it. And if this is a government-led green plan. It's like you know, at EU you have your green deal, and America and uh, and uh, Australia, everyone have their own green plan and all. So this is Singapore's green plan was launched in February 2021, and uh, across uh, across five ministries, uh, they are all looking at how can they drive. Singapore to maintain green and clean and green and lower carbon footprint and also transition to you know renewable energy and you can see that the five ministry not just about sustainability and the environment but trade and industry transport uh, national development and education so everyone is on board to drive this you know green economy drive sustainable living lifestyle and uh, how do we reset and reduce you know energy consumption and uh, we have very clear guidelines for like green building. Uh, by 2030, uh, the government has said that 80% of all buildings in Singapore, all buildings, not just new buildings, all buildings including schools, hospital, everything, 80% must be green mark certified. And for now, we are hitting about 45, below 45%. So the next eight years, we have a lot of buildings to green, especially the older building which is a tall order, it's not easy. Even your green, so-called one building is difficult. And now we are not just talking, talking, okay, green building standard, we have four level here. The mandatory requirement is certification level. We have gold, gold plus, and platinum level, which is similar to BIM and uh, to LEED as well. And so now we are talking about super low energy building, not just green building. Super low energy building means you are 60% more energy efficient than the convention which is again very difficult. And uh, only with imagination, innovation, technology, applying it effectively, then you can you know, probably you know, help to achieve the so-called super low energy. It's very challenging, but I'll show you a couple of examples later. And green economy is important. There is expected about 60,000 uh, green jobs will be in the market in the next 10 years, by 2030. So there are a lot of green jobs around, not just in Singapore, globally as well. And uh, yesterday, we just launched the so-called Sustainability Connect. That is to connect people, professional, new professional or current professional who want to scale up to learn more about sustainability, profession, technology, knowledge, and also resources, grants to, uh, to, scale, uh, to, to scale up their skills. So do contact us if you are interested. Okay, this picture is actually taken in 20, uh, uh, 2013. Uh, when Singapore was really attacked by haze due to the uh, forest fire in our neighboring country. And this is a real picture, not, you know, filtered or what. And uh, you can see a little bit of marina, you know, background there. And Singapore, you have, those who have been here, you always see sunshine. You always see, you know, blue sky apart from the rainy day. So, but we are also vulnerable, you know, to climate change to, you know, haze, air pollutions and all. And uh, that is also why, as even a small country like us, we are 
we are only uh, contributing about 0.1% of global greenhouse gas emission, you know, globally. We're very small, but we still have to do more because we are very vulnerable and we are also, you know, surrounded by larger countries. And uh, whatever happened around, it, it will affect us as well. So Hayes was a very good example in 2013 and 2015. And so just now, we, when I first started, you know, most of the populations in the world now are living in the cities, okay? And, uh, but cities only account for 3% of land mass, but uh, account for 70% of greenhouse gas emission, which is quite scary. And uh, if we can change the built environment, and we can change, you know, the way we manage our city and how people use the buildings, there will be, you know, it will make a difference. The needle will move, okay? So just to showcase, you know, some of the examples that uh, just demonstrates that dreams can be realized if you dare to dream and dare to change and really apply your skill set, your idea to it. And uh, for those who may not know CDL, we are actually uh, about close to 60 years old now by 2023. And we are a local company. We started with eight employees in, 20, in 1963. And uh, we were also a home builder at that time. Um, eight employees, and, but today we are operating in 29 countries and regions, not just building home, office building, and also uh, we have quite a sizable you know, investment portfolio. We are a, a landlord, uh, not just in Singapore, but in London and Australia and the region as well. And we have a hotel footprint of 150 over hotels worldwide under the Millennium and Copcom brand. And uh, some uh, actually we designed and built it, but uh, we contract it out. Uh, for example, the Orchard uh, St. Regis Hotel is ours. W Hotel in Sentosa is also built and designed by us, but managed by um, the W and St. Regis brand. And uh, JW Marriott, also the same. Okay, so as a company, uh, ESG is very important uh, for us. And we started the journey more than two decades ago. And uh, this, the so-called strategic pillar, uh, just for easy to you know, articulate, there are four I that we adopt which is actually the integration. ESG cannot be effective if it is operating in silos. That means only this team is doing sustainability. The rest of the companies are not doing it. So you must integrate it you know, from the board to the management to operational level and also across you know, uh, all operating and business units as well. And innovation adaptation is very important. It will not change if you don't adapt solutions. You know, you know, 10 years ago and, and now, or even five years ago, technology has changed a lot. So every year we try to look for new technology and innovation, and uh, we need to invest, put money where your mouth is. You have to invest in, you know, to green the way we build and design, and we need to measure impact because what get measured, get managed. If you don't even know your exam you know, result, whether you are good or bad or average, how are you going to improve? So same thing that we have to look at uh, impact and uh, therefore sustainability reporting is very important. And there, what are we aiming to deliver? There are 3D, which is decarbonization, which is very important. If you don't decarbonize effectively, you can't really you know, excel in the, in the global race to zero. And digitalization innovation is also an enabler and also a deliverable for us. And uh, disclosure, communication, investor wants the data, government wants the data, and even consumer nowadays also ask, like when you come into a building, they will ask about your, oh, okay, your indoor air quality, is it good, is it strong enough to filter out, you know, virus and germs? So consumer sustainability strategy are not two sets. They have to merge, they have to be integrated, and they have to go hand in hand, okay? So this is actually a chart to show that at the center here, that is when we first started in 1995, we look at conserving as we construct as our corporate ethos. So we applied it to the way we design, build, and also manage property. And of course, over the years, at that time in the 90s, the movement is very slow, okay? But nowadays, everybody is racing, running rather than slowly looking. And, uh, and uh, over the years, over the past two decades, we have actually embraced a lot of global standards. And I'm sure you are familiar with the uh, UN SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, if for those who want to know more, there are a lot, a lot of information, especially on the UN Global Compact. Uh, their website, they have a lot of 17 goals and 169 targets. 
look at all these, they almost cover every aspect that you need to know about sustainable development. Okay? And then, of course, in terms of reporting, it's a really, we, they call, we call it a hot soup of alphabets. Okay? We look at GRI, which is the oldest you know, sustain, uh, uh, reporting standard, the Global Reporting Initiative. And then we started uh, adopting it in 2008. And at that time, sustainability reporting in Asia or Singapore was not mandatory. Only until 2017, SGX, the Singapore Exchange, made it mandatory for reporting. Okay? So 10 years ago, we have already, before the mandatory requirement, we have already pro uh, published the very first sustainability report in Singapore. And uh, over the years, we actually embraced like, CDP, which is the Carbon Disclosure Project, and uh, integrated approach, making business and financial sense of ESG. And uh, business students need to know why ESG, what, does it, bring, what does, it, does it benefit the company, your product, your business, and your future proof your business. And of course, uh, SDG, I talked about this. Since 2016, we have embraced the relevant SDG, and uh, today we have actually embraced seven, uh, 14 out of 17 goals. We started with nine, and then we expanded it. And uh, TCFD is very important, the Task Force for uh, Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. Some of you may have read about it already. And uh, this is actually adopted by many uh, national level also countries, like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, you know, they're already embracing TCFD, making it mandatory. Similarly, SGX just uh, announced it just before uh, New Year. They announced it, TCFD climate uh, reporting is mandatory, you know, in the next three years progressively, all listed companies in Singapore have to come up with climate reporting, okay? And uh, SVTI is science-based target initiative, uh, which is actually backed by science only. You cannot make friends with them and get them endorse your reduction target. You really have to show data, past, current, and projected data. And now we are actually, when we first started uh, to achieve SVTI reduction target, it was 2018. That was aligned with two degrees, warmer scenario. And today, we have actually uh, just passed the exam and uh, aligned it with 1.5 degree because we are not talking about two degree anymore, like the Paris Agreement has already changed it. And uh, then the last two is actually very investor-related. SESB, which is uh, uh, really supported by the Wall Street you know, um, uh, investors and bankers. Uh, SESB is actually the... Sustainable Sustainability Accounting Standard Board, okay? Uh, CDSB is the Climate Disclosure Standard Board. So there are a lot, a lot of acrolyn. That's not all. These are the key ones. There's a couple hundred more. So, but not the more, the merrier. If you, when you join the workforce, you work for a company, just advise your management. This is not like the more means you, 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 can, you can get more investment. Look at what are material to your company, your operation, your business and select those that you, is most relevant for you, okay? Same for SDG, doesn't mean that there are 17 goals, means you have to embrace all. Like number one and two, for private sector, is very difficult. I cannot guarantee no hunger, no poverty in the world. That is the role of like, you know, the UN and also government level, yeah? But we can contribute, we can help. But writing a check doesn't mean you can, you can put your logo there. It's like, you know, poverty and all. Okay. Okay, this is uh, climate change, and uh, as we all know that uh, climate threats is changing uh, every, every year, every month. So we have to look at what is the likely financial impact to your business. And this is actually the climate change scenario planning. We don't look at past or current. We have to look at, by 2030, some of our property, you know, um, may be near the, you know, seafront. What is the likely impact if there is rising sea level, right? And what is the likely impact for, you know, due to extreme weather. So we are looking ahead for, you know, we have done uh, two scenario planning already, and we look at what are the likely threats and uh, physical threats and also uh, transition threats, which is actually talking about the regulatory changes. And we look at the key market, uh, not just in Singapore, we look at UK, China, and US also. All our investment portfolio are under, you know, we, we did a very deep, deep dive into the analysis and look at, at the future um, scenario. And then, of course, the third eye is actually innovation. Some example only, I'm not going to get deep into it. Singapore is very hot, heating up twice as fast as other parts of the world, and we are just one degree north of the equator. Okay? And uh, so, cooling 
the living environment or the interior of, of, of uh, you know, living space, workspace is our, always our top priority. So is it just technologies that matter? It's not. Even the design is very important. When you get hold of a plot of land, how do you design, how do you orientate your buildings to uh, maximize the wind flow? And uh, you know, it's very important. So AI, digital technology can help us to design, like for example, this particular uh, condominium in Bolivar, Orchard Bolivar, the orientation, the, actually the, DI, uh, the digital method help us to reduce heat gain by 20%. Okay, so the efforts start from drawing board, not right after you build it, you put in a lot of, you know, air condition, cooling, that will be too late already. From design all the way to how you build and uh, how you engage your, your homeowner also. And this one is a very cool building, you know, uh, if you have time. This is Dairy Farm Road and uh, this building has like a 24 storey high uh, so-called vertical garden. Okay, it's very mature now, and uh, go and take a look. It, it made it to the Guinness World Record uh, for almost two years in 2014, when we actually uh, just uh, uh, handed over to our home users. And uh, we actually conducted a one-year study. What is the impact of this wall? And uh, indeed, it helped us to help the uh, homeowner, 48 units behind this wall, to reduce uh, heat by up to three degrees Celsius. That means, you don't need to full blast your air condition when you come home because this is facing west. That means a lot of afternoon sun. But this, you know, green wall helped to lower the, you know, the heat gain. And uh, vertical greening is very important for, you know, this is actually one of our newest uh, uh, mixed development coming up in the CBD area. Uh, uh, called uh, it's the current Fuji Xerox building. So this building has uh, the components of residential, service apartment, hotel, and a commercial office as well. So we are very glad to have just received last, last week only uh, from our local BCA Building and Construction Authority that we have achieved from the planning stage. We are already looking at, you know, we uh, achieved the super low energy level. So it is already given to us. But of course, this is still the drawing plan. We must apply it to make sure we meet the standard when we deliver, finish the building. Okay? So there are also like, how do you reimagining spaces? Okay, the last 20 months, we all experienced a lot of changes. Your home, well, your office, right? Most of us, or your, your school, your home for us is that we have been working from home for, for almost 20 months now. And I'm sure there are a lot of home study also, whether even, even primary school or, 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 you know, or, or university. So how we design home to facilitate that transition and uh, like this one, the latest one, we actually have the flexible design and, uh, you know, which is transferable between like living space and working space. And uh, you know, the condominium, you have clubhouse and all that. We actually transfer some of the space to, you know, to play the role as like a conference, to make conference call for meeting for our residents. And uh, of course, inside the house itself, your apartment, uh, residents are now very concerned about their health and safety, their air quality. So how we actually present to them the products that make them have the peace of mind to invest in their property is very important. Indoor air quality, health, you know, is very important for them. And more and more uh, uh, in demand now is actually uh, greenery, okay? A lot of people like to, you know, uh, feel find peace you know, in nature. So we invest a lot of you know, the site area of every individual development into greenery, landscape, and facility. So like this one at Empire Park, it's actually we dedicated 65%, 65%, which is way above, almost 20% higher than mandatory requirement. And that is really a, really a big draw because they like, there's a jogging track here, this uh, on the rooftop here, this is like a, a jogging track, uh, linking three blocks at the rooftop, overlooking the sea. So every morning you can, you know, residents can go up and jog and then, you know, enjoy the sea breeze and the, and the fresh air. So these are the really what uh, home buyers are looking at, okay? And then we are also looking at older building, industrial building. The energy efficiency is very, very low and all because of old technology and all. So apart from retrofitting it, we also look at new solutions. Like for example, this is a very old industrial building. We turn the rooftop to a solar plant. So once this is completed, it will turn the you know, source of energy to 
50% to renewable to solar. So there are always solutions, but every property may have different solutions, different problems and all. And uh, we need to do research. R&D, you know, you can never stop because change is, you know, um, every day you are facing changes. So we actually partner with NUS, the School of Design and Environment, since 2016, and we set up two labs for R&D and uh, to look at how to lower the, you know, the, the heat gain in, in, inside the house and how to reduce noise level and also, you know, haze uh, and uh, antibacterial flooring and all. So we have two labs. One is the so-called the smart green home lab. The other one is actually tropical technology lab, looking at new generation, newer generation of you know uh, solar panels and uh, you know um, building materials. So these are some of the so-called innovation that I was like to just you know like for example last year, every every actually 2020 everyone was worrying about like public you know touch points and all that right. So um, the the researcher and professor at, uh, at, uh, from the lab actually developed an antiviral disposable adhesive, you know, like a, like a sticker. And uh, not just the spray, the spray after, you know, the uh, touch, uh, uh, the public use it for a few hours, the effect is gone already. So this adhesive uh, film uh, has gone through the, yeah, the lab test in the States and uh, it is proven to be very effective to, to uh, help the touch points free from uh, viral, you know, infection and all. And of course, digital platform is very important to help us look at uh, predictive, uh, predictive uh, management facility and building management to help us to reduce you know, manpower usage and also uh, energy consumption as well. So there are some you know, vertical farming and also new generation of you know, um, PV panel. Solar panel, you always look at it as something like that, very boring, just uh, you know, very industrial looking. But now we have new generation that you can print, you know, your marketing message or your corporate logo there and all. So this is we are being uh, being piloted at our sustainability academy, and uh, we have to look at the harvest, the yield, whether the prints will affect the yield of you know and uh, the energy generation. So there are a lot of technology can really help us, and uh, I'm sure that you are in a generation that a lot of probably some of your friends. They don't want to work for corporate or government. They want to do startup, right? I'm sure that is, is something that you are familiar with. And uh, actually, we have an incubator at Republic Plaza, our basement level, and that is to set up a share office for new startup from one to three years ago. I mean, one to three year old uh, new startup that need office space. It's a share office space, but the selective uh, 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 criteria is very stringent. It has to serve one or more SDG, whether it is uh, climate action, innovation, or reducing you know, uh, uh, fossil fuel and all that. So uh, we have, uh, we actually opened in September 2019, and uh, it was locked down last year and all, but we still continue and we reopened it uh, earlier, uh, 2020, uh, last year we reopened it, but with control number of usage. And uh, those that who are interested, let us know. And we also invest directly in the VC fund and also technologies and solutions that is relevant to our business. And uh, last but not least, this is just to show that going green is a journey. It's not possible that you just wake up one day and say, oh, I want to go green and uh, net zero. You need uh, you know, a journey really committed to it, strategic integration, and also application of technology, engaging your whole value chain, your whole company, and uh, this is actually some of our examples. Some may, may know that um, uh, carbon neutral building is Tampines Concourse. This is the very first one in Asia Pacific. Uh, we neutralized uh, all the carbon footprint from design production stage to management stage. And uh, we just actually launched it in our social media also. Apart from carbon neutral, we have made this building plastic neutral. That is the very first plastic neutral certification that achieved in Singapore and the region. And uh, what we engage is like to make, you know, ensure our usage of and at disposal of plastic waste are uh, audited and certified to be uh, plastic neutral. And so we hope that that will set the standard because uh, you know that more than about 80% of the marine waste are actually from men on land. So we need to change the way we behave. We cannot see, treat our ocean as like a garbage dump. So that is what we are doing all this to hope that we can drive change. 
And uh, of course, uh, those who are familiar with Botanic Gardens, do please do go and visit our uh, Zero Energy Building, Green Gallery. There is a climate action exhibition going on. Please go and visit. And uh, then the Academy, which is actually a net zero building on the roof garden of City Square Mall, which is where we actually provide rent-free rent space for NGO to promote climate action and also SDG. Last but not least, this is actually the uh, over the last five years, we have been eyeing on when can we pledge net zero. Again, it's not something you just pledge, but without a plan, without a pathway to achieve it, to, to be responsible, otherwise we will be, you know, alleged as greenwashing. So that is what we did. Actually, in 2015, we have already planned out how we want to achieve and pledge it, you know, in 2020, we find, uh, 2021 this year, we finally pledged the net zero aligning with the global standards set by World Green Building Council. This marks the beginning of a lot of work. Because we have the pathway, but you have to really stick to the plan and really act on it in order to achieve uh, net zero. So last but not least, impact is very important. We can't do it alone. We can't do, even government cannot do it alone. So don't talk about private sector. And we need to present it as a strong business case. We can't just tell our shareholders that we will want to save the world even at loss. We have to show them that we can benefit from it. For example, we engage even our tenants. 100% of our tenants are supporting uh, uh, our green lease. So supporting our green movement and, and all. And uh, we also maintain you know, um, good financial performance and, and all. And uh, so last but not least, this is our report card. This is actually like uh, we are included in 13 leading sustainability ratings and ranking, including uh, uh, the Global 100. We are maintaining the top uh, among all real estate companies in the world, you know, to be more sustainable. And uh, of course, the others we are familiar with is the Dow Jones, MSCI, CDP, and, and uh, FTSE for good and all. So we are very happy with this um, report card. And this is very important to help us to gain access to funding. And uh, that's now in the beginning, I talked about sustainable finance. We actually issued the first green bond in Singapore in April 2017. And over the last four years, we have actually maintained very active to tap onto sustainable finance to accelerate our green building movement and action, turn idea into you know, uh, 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 buildings and products and all. So we actually amass about $3 billion now, and we are delivering results and uh, you know, creating positive impact. And uh, this is actually Milton Friedman's uh, uh, ideology is dead, uh, pronounced by you know, uh, Paul Pullman, who is actually a global leader in sustainability. And uh, it's true that business of business is no longer just making profits just for shareholders. You have to look at the larger uh, ecosystem of stakeholders, community and all. And uh, the good old you know, uh, triple bottom line, you have to add purpose and sustainable to it, how to protect our planet and how to make profits not at the expense of the, the environment and the people. So this is where the business students like you should probably you know, advocate this and also practice it when you start the workforce. Engaging community is very important. Green building to a lot of people, they don't really know. That's why we set up these uh, green galleries to help to educate and engage people. And uh, young people, very important. If you go to the Beach Road uh, Central Library basement, you can visit our tree, My Tree House, uh, which is actually the world's first uh, green library for children. And, uh, we want to nurture the next generation of you know, eco champion. And this is the Sustainability Academy that uh, over the four, five years that we have set up, every, year, every week we have activity training programs and all. And uh, do let us know if you have any you know, things to share. And I think on a personal basis, everyone have the reasons to drive change and, and all. So why I actually started my journey in sustainability in 1995, is after I gave birth to my second daughter. And uh, I have two, two, two young babies then. And uh, what I feel is I was working in a bank and I feel that hmm, I really want to do more for the you know, environment and to leave behind a world, to contribute to a world that I want my kids and my you know, grandchildren to enjoy. So that is where I changed my career to join the property sector. And of course, sustainability was not a, a hot topic at that time. So we are just looking at environmental protection. So that's how I started my journey. And uh, this photo is actually an award-winning photo, and I really can relate to it. It's like, you know, and this lady 
is a mother with a kid, and you see the shoulder, he can get with love, care, and you know, determination. You can do a lot and carry a lot on our shoulder. And that is what a lot of climate activists, sustainability practitioners are doing. And I sleep very few hours a day, but there's so much that we could do. Yeah? Okay? Everyone here, please, young people, you have full of energy and passion. Shoulder a lot bigger, you know, uh, 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 responsibility and advance change resilience for a sustainable future. And uh, I'm sorry I over, overrun a little bit, uh, Xavier. I, I right. hope. Uh, happy to take any question you may have. Thank you very much for your presentation. In your opinions, involving financial tools such as taxes could engage more the company into revising their process to take into account the climate change and global warming. And if yes, do you think that it could be feasible? Sorry, I couldn't get the, the first. Sorry, thing. sorry. Yeah. Is it taxes? Did, did yes, it? yes, taxes. Tax, right? Yeah, yeah, Com yeah. Uh, carbon tax and all that, right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, definitely, regulator can really drive change like overnight, right? Because that is licensed to operate. If they ask us to change, you know, the, the green building standard, we have to follow. Otherwise, we can't get the permits to build or to sell. And uh, this uh, carbon tax is already a hot topic. And uh, you can uh, probably see the change for Singapore. Uh, budget uh, announcement is actually uh, on the 18th of February. Okay, every year there's an annual budget. Uh, every year, everyone is uh, you know seeing the signs that you know our minister for finance already make it very clear that expect some change to the carbon tax. And uh, carbon tax is really a key driver, especially not just for individual users, actually businesses, because asset owner like us, building owner like us, we have to really look at the possible impact. If carbon tax now is only $5 per tonne, if it is double or triple, what is the likely financial impact? So yes, to this uh, very, very valid question, thank you for that. Uh, regulations, including like taxation and all, will really help drive change very fast and very effective. Yeah. Thank you, Esther. We have a second question uh, from Victor. Um, and I have to say that I had the same question than him, actually. Uh, the world's production of steel and cement is responsible for 10% of greenhouse gas e um, effect gas emission, which is enormous. In addition, producing some materials such as glass, copper, to electrify the buildings is responsible for destruction of ecosystem. What if climate change and preserving our ecosystem was not about building more and more eco-friendly buildings, but just stopping building at all? For example, when it comes to housing, Singapore has a property glut that could take years to clear. And okay. to, to complete the, the Victor's question, I guess it was very clear, thank you Victor for the question, is the best eco-building is the one that we won't build? Okay, I think there are quite a, a complex questions here, and I think the focus is really like uh, sustainable building materials because you talk about cement, right? Am I am I hearing it correctly? Uh, that, yeah. that, that's good. That's one of the part of the question. Uh -huh. The other part of the question is, to what extent should we continue to build those kind of building instead of not doing it? Do we need all those all those building? To be green, is it all those buildings? No, the question is when. Uh, there is many things there. Uh, the first one is about, of course, the materials that we use. But first of all, the question is, do we need all those kind of buildings? Do we need to build other buildings all the times, many times, everywhere over the, over the planet? And this is quite an interesting question. It means that uh, it's like, for instance, if to, to, to give you another, another example, when we talk about electrical car, do we need a car? Mm -hmm. That's exactly the same approach. Mm -hmm. When you have a green building, do we need this building? Oh, well, I think it's a very uh, 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 interesting build, uh, concept. Car is different. You can live without a car. I don't think that people can live without a home. Yeah, whether rent home or rented, uh, uh, renting a space or buying a property, I think building can, and car are quite different. We, I don't think we can you know, have that analogy. But okay, green building is almost a norm already now. Green building, okay? But what your question is, like, do we need the building? Uh, let me give yeah. you another example that I have in mind. It's because when, um, 
For instance, when you look at the business model of Airbnb, it's mm. just using the non-using flat apartment room and so on and so forth. Because we know that across the planet, across the world and cities, as well as in Singapore, for instance, we have a lot of empty space, empty building, empty office as well. Mm. And if Airbnb works, it's because actually we have plenty of non-used place, office, whatever you want. Mm. So to what extent we should maybe to reshape the business model, to reshape the way of using the building mm -hmm. instead of building building. Yes. I think you're, you're talking about sharing economy, right? In a way, we, we, we talk yeah. about sustainability, basically. Yeah. Sustainability and sharing economy, circular economy, all these are solutions to, towards a sustainable future. But I think for Singapore's case, we don't really have a lot of Un underutilized building as of now, but things are changing very fast. I totally agree with you. Like, for example, office space. Over the last 20 months, a lot of people are getting used to working from home. And then, you know, now when we are opening up, there are actually a lot of debate that is like, oh, okay, should we work uh, th uh, three days at office, two days home, or, you know, or whatever. So I think. Things are really changing, and uh, like I said, even how you build your residential development, you have to build in like, some office space usage into your condominium as well. So there is actually the, 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 the blurring of the line of living space, working space, and all. So I totally agree with you that we have to look at like, you know, whether there is any underutilized uh, spaces that can be used for sharing and all. And uh, that is also why the share uh, uh, spaces, Airbnb, is so popular. And uh, we have also turned some hotels into uh, you know, some Airbnb yeah, purpose already. So the whole world, like I said, changes the, 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 the really you know, something that is not a choice. So as a business, how you run your manage your business is very important. And uh, mind you, actually, share office was not picking up very fast over the 20 months because people don't want to share because of hygienic reason. They are very worried about like, like safety and all. In the past, we don't really worry. Like we walk into a share office, we just sit anywhere you want and use the facility. But now people are very cautious because. They don't want a touch point. In, in fact, you see, you have hand sanitizers everywhere. So there is also a difference between like share office will be the, the trend or you still want the privacy. So there are still changes going on now. And, uh, but yes, you are right. We, are, you know, we, we don't have a solution right now, but we have to look at how to anticipate change. And uh, I want to go back to the green building, you know, and uh, the first part of the question is very relevant because you have to engage supply chain. And we also look at how they can help us because that is the scope three and body carbon. When we look at uh, so-called net zero science-based target reduction, they don't look at scope one or scope two. Scope two is where you purchase from the grid, the energy, which is the largest consumption of every business. Scope three is where getting more and more important is looking at like your supply chain, your sustainable uh, building materials, and uh, your you know um, trans uh, uh, communication, transportation uh, footprint of your staff and even your tenants and all. So this is a big topic for Embody Carbon, and cement is uh, one of the top building material. Cement and sands, concrete at the top, and steel second you know, for building materials. So this is, that's why the trend is now looking at recycled or, uh, you know, uh, uh, sustainable steel. But these are still at the early stage. And uh, we also have to look at cost. We don't just like, or blindly just look at, you know, material, but don't look at the, the you know, the, the cost management. And uh, a lot of change, uh, things are changing. Uh, carbon capture for cement is something that is, is very big now, but very, infant, you know, very infancy stage. So we are, as developer, we are all looking at all these possibilities. We have another, we have many, many questions actually. Uh, we won't be able to take all of them, but um, one from Blanche. Uh, Thanks a lot. Interesting to see all net zero large scale agreements with bank finance and investments. We know how important are investors when it comes to building a sustainable world. However, I just arrived from France. It's a shock to see so many cars, plastic in supermarket, meat in every meal, aircon everywhere. Do you think Singapore is taking enough concrete action to counter climate change? Do you think people are aware enough to challenge of climate change? To what extent are Singaporeans concerned about climate change in their everyday life? 
Do you consider yourself and your company as an exception? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the top of the pyramid is still minority. And uh, we hope change can be faster. And we notice that the change is coming fast and furious. And uh, <clears throat> like I said, in the COP26, it was in the past COP, apart from uh, you know, COP21 in Paris, the agreement, other than that, many don't even follow. So COP22, 20, 23, 24, no, no, nobody really talked much about it until COP26 seems to have a very high profile because of the climate emergency. So I think uh, the world is changing very fast with all the political uh, you know, leaders are driving it, regulations are driving it, investors, financiers, everyone is driving to the same direction. And I'm quite hopeful that even after two decades, I think this is the real uh, uh, tipping point that we can't go back you know, to the old normal. And I think change will speed up much faster than the last two decades. Thank you. We have another question. I guess it's Benjamin. I'm not sure about that. Thanks to you for the presentations. We have seen a lot of high-end products and new technologies that can help to reduce carbon emissions. However, they may be costly at first. We can also see that for lower-income lower income populations, carbon zero challenge remains a very far away concern while their share in carbon emission will increase over the next decades. How can we integrate everyone in the climate transition? I quote again, I continue to quote, I find it quite paradoxical, uh, paradoxical to debate in a building aircon cooled at 19 degrees Celsius on how to reduce carbon emission. Yeah. Emission. Mm, 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 mm. Yes, okay. Uh, well, definitely, uh, Decarbonization is key for every industry, you know, every uh, nations and all. And uh, that is why we talk about green buildings and, uh, you know, setting zero, net zero target is a key to drive. If you are not, um, you know, setting ambitious target, you can't, you know, get everyone on board to, the, to go to the same directions that you want. Yes, uh, building code has changed also. In the good old day, it was like 22 degrees Celsius, you know, 21 to 25 degrees, and you can really walk into building. I'm talking about Celsius, I'm not familiar with the Fahrenheit. So you can walk into a building or some shopping mall, it's like freezing cold. But now I think you will see less of that already because the building code has also raised the, te the temperature already. And uh, of course, building owner has to take responsibility. And uh, like under our green lease, we also set our temperature to 23 to 24 degrees, you know. And uh, we won't go back to the, the time that is like 21 or 22 degrees. It's too cold, even for, for uh, uh, tropical weather. So people are more mindful now. And that's why we need to look at the digital, you know, uh, management of building. Area that there's no, bid, no action, no people, we actually switch it off, the, you know, lighting or, or whatever. But if we don't know, Without all the sensors to know that hey, this area nobody really use it, we can actually you know manage it and reduce the usage of energy. So now there are a lot more technology can help us to manage buildings in a more efficient manner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Esther. Thank you for your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Esther. Um, just, uh, I just want to, because I, I thought about it, one of our former students at ESSEC, uh, Sandra Marichal, actually, she lived in Singapore for many, many years, um, and she has decided to create uh, an association, a club, actually, that was a long time ago now, she, knows she doesn't live in Singapore anymore, and she has decided to create an association, it's one degree, and the association was to convince the mall and convince the building, actually, to increase the temperature in Singapore, so she was a very strong activist. She's very interested I think she, we, we invited her here for during Imagination Week, and we have a talk that she, when she came around. Thank you very much. Um, our next conference would be at two, but before that, I want to introduce Aisha, please. Aisha, Aisha, sorry. Thank you very much. Aisha is our artist in residence. As I've mentioned to you at the beginning of the week, we have every single week we have artists in the residence, Sergi as well as in Singapore, and this week, uh, Aisha is the one artist in residence and he is at the level four. So we highly encourage you to visit him, to interact with him, that the purpose to have an artist in residence is not just to have to comment someone about art, but someone who is really doing a war, doing something. So uh, don't hesitate to interact with him and on Friday he will give a, give a talk to her, to 
us. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Harsha.